Book Two, Part Two of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid by Publius Regilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Two, How They Took the City, Part Two. Thus, when the rival winds their quarrel try, contending for the kingdom of the sky. South, east, and west on airy coursers borne, the whirlwind gathers, and the woods are torn. Then Nereus strikes the deep, the billows rise, and mixed with ooze and sand pollute the skies. And troops we squandered first again appear, from several quarters and enclose the rear. They first observe, and to the rest betray, our different speech and our borrowed arms survey. Oppressed with odds, we fall, Corobus first, at Pallas's altar, by Penelius pierced. Then Ripheus followed in the unequal fight, just of his word, observant of the right. Heaven thought not so, Dymus their fate attends, with Hyponus mistaken by their friends. Nor Pantheus, thee, thy mitre, nor the bands of awful Phobus saved from impious hands. Ye Trojan flames, your testimony bear, what I performed and what I suffered there. No sword avoiding in the fateful strife, exposed to death and prodigal of life. Witness, ye heavens, I live not by my fault. I strove to have deserved the death I sought. But when I could not fight and would have died, borne off to distance by the growing tide, old Iphitus and I were hurried thence, with Peleus wounded and without defense. New clamors from the invested palace ring. We run to die or disengage the king. So hot the assault, so high the tumult rose, while ours defend and while the Greeks oppose, as all that Dardan and Argolic race had been contracted in that narrow space. Or as Ilium else were void of fear and tumult, war, and slaughter only there. Their targets in a tortoise cast, the foes, securely advancing to the turrets rose. Some mount the scaling ladders, some more bold, swerve upwards and by posts and pillars hold. Their left hand gripes their bucklers in the ascent, and with their right they seize the battlement. From their demolished towers the Trojans throw huge heaps of stones that, falling, crush the foe. And heavy beams and rafters from the sides, such arms their last necessity provides, and gilded roofs come tumbling from on high, the marks of state and of ancient royalty. The guards below, fixed in the past, attend, the charge undaunted and the gate defend. Renewed in courage and with recovered breath, a second time we ran to tempt our death. To clear the palace from the foe, succeed the weary living and revenge the dead. A postern door, yet unobserved and free, joined by the length of a blind gallery, to the king's closet led, a way well known, to Hector's wife, while Priam held the throne, through which she brought Istanix unseen, to cheer his grandsire and his grandsire's queen. Through this we pass, and mount the tower from whence, with unavailing arms the Trojans make defense. From this the trembling king had oft descried, the Grecian camp, and saw their navy ride. Beams from its lofty height with swords we hew, then, wrenching with our hands, the assault renew. And, where the rafters on the columns meet, we push them headlong with our arms and feet. The lightning flies not swifter than the fall, nor thunder louder than the ruined wall. Down goes the top at once, the Greeks beneath, are piecemeal torn or pounded into death. Yet more succeed, and more to death are sent. We cease not from above, nor they below relent. Before the gate stood Pyrrhus, threatening loud, with glittering arms, conspicuous in the crowd. So shines, renewed in youth, the crested snake, who slept the winter in a thorny brake, and, casting off his slough when spring returns, now looks aloft and with new glory burns. Restored with poisonous herbs his ardent sides, reflect the sun, and raised on spires he rides. High o'er the grass, hissing he roars along, and brandishes by fits his forky tongue. Proud Periphus and fierce Automedon, his father's charioteer, together run. To force the gate, the Scyrian infantry rushed in on crowds, and the barred passage free. 
Entering the court with shouts the skies they rend, And flaming firebrands to the roofs ascend. Himself among the foremost deals the blows, And with his axe repeated strokes bestows. On the strong doors then all their shoulders ply, Till from the posts the brazen hinges fly. He hews apace, the double bars at length, Yield to his axe and unresisted strength. A mighty breach is made, the rooms concealed, Appear, and all the palace is revealed, The halls of audience and of public state, And where the lonely queen in secret sate. Armed soldiers now by trembling maids are seen, With not a door and scarce a space between. The house is filled with loud laments and cries, And shrieks of women rend the vaulted skies. The fearful matrons run from place to place, And kiss the thresholds and the posts embrace. The fatal work inhuman Pyrrhus plies, and all his father sparkles in his eyes. Nor bars, nor fighting guards his force sustain. The bars are broken, and the guards are slain. In rush the Greeks, and all the apartments fill. Those few defendants whom they find, they kill. Not with so fierce a rage the foaming flood, Roars when he finds his rapid course withstood, Bears down the dams with unresisted sway, And sweeps the cattle and the cots away. These eyes beheld him when he marched between. The brother kings, I saw the unhappy queen. The hundred wives, and where old Priam stood, To stay in his hallow altered with his brood. The fifty nuptial beds, such hopes had he, So large a promise of a progeny. The posts of plated gold and hung with spoils, Fell the reward of the proud victor's toils. Wherever the raging fire had left a space, The Grecians enter and possess the place. Perhaps you may of Priam's fate inquire. He, when he saw his regal town on fire, his ruined palace and his entering foes, on every side inevitable woes, in arms, disused, invest his limbs decayed, like them with age, a late and useless aid. His feeble shoulders scarce the weight sustain. Loaded, not armed, he creeps along with pain, despairing of success, ambitious to be slain. Uncovered, but by heaven, there stood in view An altar near the hearth a laurel grew, Dottered with age, whose bow encompass round The household gods, and shade the holy ground. Here Hecuba, with her helpless train, Of dames for shelter sought, but sought in vain. Driven like a flock of doves along the sky, Their images they hug, and to their altars fly. The queen, when she beheld her trembling lord, And hanging by his side a heavy sword, what rage, she cried, has seized my husband's mind? What arms are these, and to what use designed? These times want other aids. Were Hector here, even Hector now in vain, like Priam would appear. With us one common shelter thou shalt find, or in one common fate with us be joined. She said, and with a last salute embraced, the poor old man, and by the laurel placed. Behold, Polites, one of Priam's sons, Pursued by Pyrrhus, there for safety runs. Through swords and foes, amazed and hurt he flies, Through empty courts and open galleries. Him Pyrrhus, urging with his lance, pursues, And often reaches, and his thrusts renews. The youth, transfixed with lamentable cries, Expires before his wretched parent's eyes, Whom, gasping at his feet when Priam saw, The fear of death gave place to nature's law. And shaking more with anger than with age, The gods, said he, requite thy brutal rage. As sure they will, barbarian, sure they must, If there be gods in heaven, and gods be just. Who takest in wrongs an insolent delight, With a son's death to infect a father's sight? Nor he whom thou in lying fame conspire, To call thee his, not he, thy vaunted sire. Thy used my wretched age, the gods he feared, the laws of nature and of nations heard. He cheered my sorrows, and for sums of gold, The bloody carcass of my Hector sold, Pitied the woes a parent underwent, And set me back in safety from his tent. This said, his feeble hand a javelin threw, Which, fluttering, seemed to loiter as it flew, Just, and but barely, to a market held, And faintly tinkled on the brazen shield. Then Pyrrhus said, Go thou from me to fate, and to my father my foul deeds relate. Now die, 
and with that he dragged the trembling sire, slittering through the clotted blood and holy mire. The mingled paste his murdered son had made, hauled from beneath the violated shade, and on the sacred pile the royal victim laid. His right hand held his bloody falchion bare, his left he twisted in his hoary hair. Then, with a speeding thrust, his heart he found. The lukewarm blood came rushing through the wound. The sanguine streams disdained the sacred ground. Thus Priam fell, and shared one common fate, and with Troy and ashes, and his ruined state. He, who the scepter of all Asia swayed, whom monarchs like domestic slaves obeyed, on the bleak shore now lies the abandoned king, a headless carcass in a nameless thing. Then, not before, I felt my crudled blood congeal with fear, my hair with horror stood. My father's image filled my pious mind, lest equal years might equal fortune find. Again I thought of my forsaken wife, and trembled for my son's abandoned life. I looked about, but found myself alone. Deserted at my need, my friends were gone. Some spent with toil, some with despair oppressed, leaped headlong from the heights, the flames consumed the rest. Thus, wandering in my way, without a guide, the graceless Helen in the porch I spied, a Vesta's temple, there she lurked alone. Muffled she sate, and what she could, unknown. But by the flames that cast their blaze around, that common bane of Greece and Troy I found. For Ilium burns, she dreads the Trojan sword, more dreads the vengeance of her injured lord. Even by those gods who refuged her aboard, trembled with rage the strumpet I regard, resolved to give her guilt the due reward. Shall she triumphant sail before the wind, and leave on flames unhappy Troy behind? Shall she her kingdom and her friends review, in state attended with a captive crew, while unrevenged the good old Priam falls, and Grecian fires consume the Trojan walls? For this the Phrygian fields in Xanthian flood were swelled with bodies and were drunk with blood? Tis as true a soldier can small honor gain, and boast no conquest from a woman slain. Yet shall the fact not pass without applause, a vengeance taken in so just a cause. The punished crime shall set my soul at ease, the murmuring manes of my friends appease. Thus while I rave, a gleam of pleasing light spread over the palace and shining heavenly bright. My mother stood revealed before my sight, never so radiant did her eyes appear, not her own star confessed a light so clear. Great in her charms, as, when on gods above, she looks and breathes herself into their love. She held my hand, the destined blow to break, then from her rosy lips began to speak. My son, from whence this madness, this neglect, of my commands and those whom I protect? Why this unmanly rage? Recall to mind, whom you forsake, what pledges leave behind? Look if your helpless father yet survive or if Ascanius or Corsa live. Around your house the greedy Grecians err, and these had perished in the nightly war, but in my presence and protecting care. Not Helen's face nor Paris was in fault, but by the gods was this destruction brought. Now cast thy eyes around while I dissolve the mists and films that mortal eyes involve. Purge from your sight the dross, and make you see the shape of every avenging deity. Enlighten thus, my just commands fulfill, nor fear obedience to thy mother's will. Where yon disordered heap of ruin lies, stones rent from stones, where clouds of dust arise. Amid that smother, Neptune holds his place, below the wall's foundation drives his mace, and heaves the building from the solid base. Look where, in arms, imperial Juno stands, full in the sky on gate, with loud commands, urging on shore the tardy Grecian bands. See, See, Pallas, on her snakely buckler proud, bestrides the tower, refulgent through the crowd. See, Jove, new courage to the foe supplies, and arms against the town, the partial deities. Haste, hence, my son, this fruitless labor end. Haste, where your troubling spouse and sire attend. Haste, and a mother's care your passage shall befriend. She said, and swiftly vanished from my sight obscured in clouds and gloomy shades of night. I looked, I listened, dreadful sounds I hear, and the dire forms of hostile gods appear. 
Troy, sunk in flames I saw, nor could prevent, And Ilium from its old foundations rent, Rent like a mountain ash, which dared the winds, And stood the sturdy strokes of laboring hinds. About the roots the cruel axe resounds, And stumps are pierced with oft-repeated wounds. The war is felt on high, the nodding crown, Now threats a fall, and throws the leafy honors down. To their united force it yields, though late, And mourns with immortal groans the approaching fate. The roots no more their upper load sustain, But down she falls and spreads a ruin through the plain. Descending thence I scrape through foes and fire, Before the goddess foes and flames retire. Arrived at home, he, for whose only sake, Or most for his, such toils I undertake, the good Anchises, whom, by timely flight, I proposed to secure on Ida's height, refused the journey, resolute to die, and added his funerals to the fate of Troy. Rather than exile and old age sustain, go you whose blood runs warm in every vein. Had heaven decreed that I should life enjoy, heaven had decreed to save unhappy Troy. Tis sure enough, if not too much for one, twice to have seen our Ilium overthrown. Make haste to save the poor remaining crew, and give this useless corpse a long adieu. These weak old hands suffice to stop my breath, at least pitying the foes will aid my death, to take my spoils and leave my body bare. As for my sepulchre, let heaven take care. Tis long since I, for my celestial wife, loathed by the gods, had dragged a lingering life. Since every hour in moment I expire, Blasted from heaven by Jove's avenging fire, This oft repeated he stood fixed to die, Myself, my wife, my son, my family, Entreat, pray, beg, and raise a doleful cry. What? Will he still persist on death resolve, And in his ruin all his house involve? He still persists his reason to maintain, Our prayers, our tears, our loud laments are vain. Urged by despair, again I go to try, The fate of arms resolved in fight to die. What hope remains, but what my death must give? Can I, without so dear a father, live? You term it prudence, what I baseness call. Could such a word from such a parent fall? If fortune please, and so the gods ordain, That nothing should of ruin Troy remain, And you conspire with fortune to be slain. The way to death is wide, the approach is near, for soon relentless Pyrrhus will appear, reeking with Priam's blood, the wretch who slew, the son inhuman in the father's view. And then the sire himself to the dire altar drew, O goddess mother, give me back to fate, your gift was undesired and came too late. Did you, for this, unhappy me convey, through foes and fires, to see my house a prey? Shall I, my father, wife, and son behold, Waltering in blood, each other's arms enfold. Haste, girt my sword, through spent and overcome. Tis the last summons to receive our doom. I hear thee, fate, and I obey thy call. Not unrevenged the foe shall see my fall. Restore me the yet unfinished fight. My death is wanting to conclude the night. Armed once again my glittering sword I wield, While the other hand sustains my weighty shield and forth I rushed to seek the abandoned field. I went, but sad Croesa stopped my way, and crossed the threshold in my passage lay, embraced my knees, and when I would have gone, showed me my feeble sire and tender son. If death be your design at least, said she, take us along to share your destiny. If any farther hopes in arms remain, this place, these pledges of your love maintain. To whom do you expose your father's life? Your sons and mine, your now forgotten wife. While thus she fills the house with clamoring cries, Our hearing is diverted by our eyes. For while I held my son in the short space, Betwixt our kisses and our last embrace, Strange to relate, from young Ulysses' head, A lambent flame arose which gently spread, Around his brows and on his temples fed. Amazed with running water we prepare, To quench the sacred fire and slake his hair. But old Anchises, versed in omens, reared his hands to heaven, and this request preferred. If any vows almighty Joe can bend, 
thy will, if piety can prayers command, confirm the glad presage which thou art pleased to send. Scarce had he said, when on our left we hear a peal of rattling thunder roll in air. There shot a streaming lamp across the sky, which on the winged lightning seemed to fly. From o'er the roof the blaze began to move, and trailing vanished in the Idean grove. It swept a path in heaven, and shone a guide, then in a streaming stench of sulphur died. The good old man with suppliant hands implored the god's protection, and their star adored. Now, now, said he, my son, no more delay. I yield, I follow where heaven shows the way. Keep, O my country gods, our dwelling place, and guard this relic of the Trojan race, this tender child. These omens are your own, and you can yet restore the ruined town. At least accomplish what your signs foreshow. I stand resigned and am prepared to go. He said, the crackling fires appear on high, and driving sparkles dance along the sky. With Vulcan's rage the rising winds conspire, and near our palace roll the flood of fire. Haste, my dear father, tis no time to wait, and load my shoulders with a willing freight. Whatever befalls your life shall be my care. One death or one deliverance we will share. My hand shall lead our little son, and you, my faithful consort, shall our steps pursue. Next, you, my servants, heed my strict commands. Without the walls a ruined temple stands. To Ceres, hallowed once, a cypress nigh, shoots up her venerable head on high. By long religion kept, there bend thy feet, and in divided parties let us meet. Our country gods, the relics and the bands, hold you, my father, in your guiltless hands. In me, tis impious holy things to bear, Red as I am with slaughter, new from war. Till in some living stream I cleanse the guilt Of dire debate and blood and battle spilt. Thus ordering all that prudence could provide, I clothe my shoulders with a lion's hide And yellow spoils. Then, on my bending back, The welcome load of my father take. When, on my better hand, Ascanius hung, And with unequal paces tripped along, Croisa kept behind, by choice we stray, through every dark and every devious way. I, who so bold and dauntless just before, the Grecian darts and shocks of lances bore, at every shadow now am seized with fear, not for myself, but for the charges I bear, till, near the ruined gate, arrived at last, secure and deeming all the danger past. A frightful noise of trampling feet we hear, my father, looking through the shades with fear, cried out, Haste, haste, my son, the foes are nigh, their swords and shining armor I descry. Some hostile god, for some unknown offense, had sure bereft my mind of better sense. For, while through a winding ways I took my flight, and sought the shelter of the gloomy night, at last I lost Croisa, hard to tell, if by her fatal destiny she fell, or weary sate, or wandering with affright, but she was lost forever to my sight. I knew not, nor reflected till I meet, my friends at Ceres, now deserted seat. We met, no one was wanting, only she, deceived her friends, her son, and wretched me. What mad expressions did my tongue refuse? Whom did I not of gods and men accuse? This was the fatal blow that pained me more than all I felt from ruin Troy before. Stung with my loss and raving with despair, abandoning my now forgotten care, of counsel, comfort, and of hope bereft, my sire, my son, my country gods I left, in shining armor once again I sheathe, my limbs not feeling wounds, nor fearing death, then headlong to the burning walls I run, and seek the danger I was forced to shun. I tread my former tracks through the night explore, every passage, every street I cross before, all things were full of horror and affright, and dreadful even the silence of the night. Then to my father's house I make repair, with some small glimpses of hope to find her there. Instead of her, the cruel Greeks I met. The house was filled with foes, with flames beset. Driven on the wings of winds, whole sheets of fire, through air transported to the roof's aspire. From whence to Priam's palace I resort, and search the citadel and desert court. 
Then, unobserved, I passed by Juno's church. The guard of Grecians had possessed the porch. There Phoenix and Ulysses watch prey, and thither all the wealth of Troy convey. The spoils which they from ransacked houses brought, and golden bowls from burning altars caught. The tables of the gods, the purple vests, the people's treasure, and the pomp of priests. A rank of wretched youths with pinion hands, and captive matrons in long order stands. Then, with ungoverned madness, I proclaim, through all the silent street, Croesus' name. Croesa still I call, at length she hears, and sudden through the shades of night appears. Appears no more Croesa, nor my wife, but a pale spectre larger than the life. Aghast, astonished, and struck dumb with fear, I stood, like bristles rose my stiffened hair. Then thus the ghost began to soothe my grief, nor tears nor cries can give the dead relief. Desist, my much-loved lord, to indulge your pain. You bear no more than what the gods ordain. My fates permit me not from hence to fly, nor he, the great controller of the sky. Long wandering ways for you the powers decree, on land hard labors and a length of sea. Then, after many painful years are past, on Latium's happy shore you shall be cast, where gentle Tiber from his bed beholds the flowery meadows and the feeding folds. There end your toils, and there your fates provide, a quiet kingdom and a royal bride. There fortune shall the Trojan line restore, and for you, lost Croesa, weep no more. Fear not that I shall watch with servile shame the imperious looks of some proud Grecian dame, or, stooping to the victor's lust, disgrace my goddess mother or my royal race. And now farewell, the parent of the gods, Restrains my fleeting soul in her abodes. I trust our common issue to your care, she said, and gliding past unseen in air. I strove to speak, but horror tied my tongue, and thrice about her neck my arms I flung, and thrice deceived my vain embraces hung. Light as an empty dream at break of day, or as a blast of wind she rushed away. Thus having passed the night in fruitless pain, I, to my longing friends, return again, amazed the augmented numbers to behold, of men and matrons mixed, of young and old, with arms appointed and with treasure fraught, resolved and willing under my command, to run all the hazards both of sea and land. The morn began, from Ida to display, her rosy cheeks, and phosphor led the day. Before the gates the Grecians took their post, and all pretense of late relief was lost. I yield to fate, unwillingly retire, and, loaded, up the hill convey my sire. End of Book Two